Our next presenter this morning is Dr. Anna Shaw. Dr. Shaw is the Associate Clinic Director of Outpatient Neurology and an Associate Professor, professor of Neurology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She will be presenting on MS Symptom Management Overview. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so I'm going to do my best to hit on um, most common symptoms that we hear about in MS. Um, but we'll, if there's questions, we're happy to answer them at the end, okay? Um, here are my disclosures, and then let's just get going. So let's start with fatigue. And I think this one is one of our most important because we hear people talk about this often. Um, based on some studies, we've seen that this is reported in up to 85% of patients, so not an uncommon symptom that we see by any means. And fatigue in MS patients can really be broken up into acute fatigue and chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue might be, hey, this is how I feel on a general basis. And acute fatigue might be, gosh, when I'm having a relapse, I feel more fatigued. Or gosh, if I'm feeling like my MS medicines are wearing off, I'm feeling more fatigued. Or in the setting of particular stressors or hot summers or things like that, I'm feeling more fatigued. You'll probably hear about um, more than a dozen different analogies that MS specialists have for fatigue. One of the ways that I really like to think about it is kind of like a tank of gas. If we say, hey, everyone's got um, a little mini Cooper tank of gas that takes them through the day um, in MS and other individuals might have a tank of gas that's in a big pickup truck. You can imagine that you can't do as much with your little mini Cooper tank of gas compared to someone who's got a pickup truck tank of gas. So thinking about it in that way, we really want to say, gosh, we know that the ability to do as many tasks in MS with that fatigue in the back, background might not be quite as extensive as others. So how do we evaluate this and how do we treat this? Because at the end of the day, we know this is an issue, but how do we make it so people have better qualities of life with having fatigue? So the most important thing that we know we need to do is make sure it's not something else. So you're going to hear this as a common theme throughout the rest of the presentation, but having a diagnosis of MS, unfortunately, is not a get out of jail free card for having other diagnoses. So the most important thing to make sure is it's not, hey, I've got fatigue related to my MS, but I also have fatigue related to another medical condition that can cause fatigue. Common things that we think about are thyroid abnormalities sleep apnea, which we'll have a whole talk about sleep care coming up on the next slide, and then medication side effects. A lot of the medications we use for treatment of symptoms in MS, thinking about things like for nerve pain, medicines that we use for spasticity, um, a lot of them have potential side effects of causing drowsiness or grogginess. So an important thing to always think about is, is this medicine potentially contributing to a worsening of my fatigue versus the benefit I'm getting from that medicine? Um, Lifestyle modifications are also incredibly important in fatigue. There have been several studies showing a regular exercise regimen has been very useful in the long-term treatment of fatigue. And now I know that sounds a little bit backwards when you say, gosh, how I treat fatigue by exercising, which makes me more fatigued. But I promise it's something that if you keep up with, not only does it make your brain stronger, but also helps with those overall levels of fatigue. Medicines um, that we use for fatigue are varied. So common ones that you'll hear us talk about are is a medicine called amantadine. Um, another group of medicines that include provigil, which is modafinil or nuvigil. Um, and then also methylphenidate um, or Adderall is a group of medications that are used for fatigue. Now, the thing that I want to bring up with these medications um, is they did a large study earlier last year. Um, where they really looked at these three different medication categories that I just discussed and looked at them in relationship for fatigue and MS. The way that the study worked was they had them all created so they looked alike and had every patient cycle through one of those three, including a placebo, which was medicine number four, and had them track their fatigue levels on those different medications. What they ultimately concluded from the study was that the fatigue levels weren't different on these medications um, of one compared to another. So we often find that insurance companies use that data 
um, to perhaps say some of these medications aren't indicated. But I think what all of us say is if something is helping, we don't really care if it's helping, right? Um, the other thing I bring up, which is something that should be an important point or an important um, conversation with your neurologist, is do I need work accommodations in relation to my fatigue or FMLA? So what that might include is, hey, if I'm working as a nurse and I typically work 12-hour shifts, might I need more frequent breaks during my shifts? Or if I'm somebody that is told, hey, I need to work three days a week um, at longer hours, can I space that out into four or five days a week at shorter hours that might help with that fatigue? Um, I think this is an important thing to understand. And one of the things um, that I know I harp on quite a bit is thinking about how sleep works. So we know in somebody that doesn't have MS, lack of good quality and quantity of sleep is going to impact levels of fatigue. So if we say, gosh, we're taking a person with MS who already has baseline fatigue, and I'm also adding on poor sleep, it's more of a one plus one is three type situation. So what this chart here shows is all of the cycles and stages of sleep we go through as we're sleeping at night. So we go through a variety of different stages, but what I really wanna focus in on is those dark blue rectangular boxes which is REM sleep, or what we also consider our restorative sleep. What happens is when we're sleeping, um, when we get into these phases of REM sleep, and I'm oversimplifying just a little bit, but what happens is we're clearing all, all the junk that we accumulate from being alive and interacting with our environment during the day. So it's incredibly important for us to make sure we're getting enough REM sleep because inadequate amounts of REM sleep will lead to memory issues, will lead to fatigue, um, will lead to multitasking or short-term attention issues, and will also increase pain perception and will also increase frequency of headaches. And if you look at how REM sleep works overnight, you can see that it takes about somewhere between 75 to 90 minutes to get into your first cycle of REM sleep, but really we're accumulating more REM sleep as the night goes on. So for example, if at hour two of sleeping, you've gotten past that first cycle of REM sleep, but you wake up because you have to use the bathroom and urinate, then guess what? As soon as you go back to sleep, you're restarting that whole cycle. And so I bring this up because not only is it important for us to recognize this, but it's also important to think about what is it that's causing me to wake up at night? Is it I need to use the bathroom? In that case, we might talk more about medications that reduce the chances of needing to use in the bathroom overnight? Or is it because I'm in pain? Is it because I have sleep apnea? What is it that's interrupting my ability to consolidate REM or my ability to sleep consecutively through the night? Um, sleep apnea is also a huge thing that we should talk about with sleep and MS. We know there are higher rates of sleep apnea in our patients with multiple sclerosis. Again, that becomes important because what happens with sleep apnea is there's these tiny little micro wake-ups that happen overnight. With these tiny little micro wake-ups, you're restarting that cycle of where you're starting and how long it's taking for you to get into REM sleep. So identification of sleep apnea is a really important thing that we like to really emphasize when we're thinking about patients that have these other issues. We also know other sleep disorders are increased in MS. Things like periodic limb movements of sleep, restless legs. Um, so even though they seem like they're unrelated um, to MS, always a good thing to talk about with your neurologist so we can brainstorm ways to help with that. Um, insomnia is another common thing that we hear about in MS patients. And when we think about insomnia, it might be, hey, I'm laying in bed for hours and I just can't get to sleep. And then I have to wake up at 6 a.m. because of kids, because of work, because of other obligations. And then guess what? I haven't had time to go into those REM cycles or sleep stages that I really need to go into. So what do we do about insomnia? Um, so one of the things that's really important is sleep hygiene. And what does sleep hygiene mean? Sleep hygiene means no screens for at least a couple hours oops, before bedtime. Sleep hygiene means don't lay in bed, sit on your phone, watch TV, even Kindles, things like that that are stimulating. Sleep hygiene means, hey, I'm using my bed only for sleep. 
I'm not using it to sit and eat dinner or relax in. Your bed should really be a place that you identify as, hey, when I hit my bed and my head hits the pillow, that's where I'm going to sleep. Um, we talk about meditation or calming practices before sleep. Also using guided imagery is very helpful for insomnia. One of my favorite things to emphasize for insomnia is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And essentially what that is, is if any of you have kids and you've sleep trained your kids, it's kind of like sleep training for adults um, without all of the crying it out. Um, so what it means is you go through essentially a several week long program where you're working with a psychologist that's particularly trained in cognitive behavioral therapy to kind of retrain how you think about sleep and how to fall asleep. There's several programs in the Denver area. There's also several websites um, and several actually iPhone and Android apps um, if you search CBTI. So always a good place to start because if we can do things without medicines, gosh, let's do them without medicines. That being said, there's several medications that we also can use for insomnia. Um, but we won't go through those in too much depth just to get to the other things. All right, let's talk a little bit about spasticity. So what is spasticity? So spasticity is tightness of muscles. Um, and we know that it's associated with lesions primarily in the spine, but also lesions in the brain. So how do we manage spasticity? So you'll hear me kind of in the management of all of these sections talk about a medicine-based management, and then non-medicine-based management. So one of the things that can be helpful for spasticity to a degree is establishing a regular stretching regimen. Now, the important thing with spasticity is not to just stretch once the spasticity or muscle spasms or cramping has already started, but to do this on a regular basis before it started, because it's a lot easier to do prevention than to try and play catch up with spasticity. Physical therapy can be incredibly important. And I know Michelle Harrison's giving a talk about physical therapy next, so I won't go into that too much. We also have medications that we use for spasticity. These include baclofen, tizanidine, or Xanaflex. And sometimes you'll hear us talk about Flexeril, but I don't think any of us love that quite as much as these first two. The importance with medications um, that are used for spasticity is they can make people sleepy. So the name of the game with medicines that are used for spasticity is to try and take them consistently and regularly so you're not getting as much fluctuation in terms of blood levels, which really helps taper down how much you're getting in terms of like that cognitive side effect or that sleepiness side effect. There's also interventions that can be used um, for the treatment of spasticity. This includes something called a baclofen pump which is a pump that kind of goes straight into the canal where your cerebrospinal fluid is and de delivers a low amount of baclofen during the day. This helps with reduction of the sleepiness associated with baclofen, but for patients to be eligible for something like this, you need to have a clear response to baclofen. Otherwise, there's not much utility in doing something like this. Botox injections can also be helpful um, particularly if there's isolated muscle groups that are very spastic. Where these um, mechanisms become more most helpful is often in the setting of where there is spasticity in MS patients, there's also weakness. And so commonly, if we say, hey, I'm isolating my upper limb, common areas we see spasticity is finger flexion, wrist flexion, elbow flexion, and kind of holding a posture like this. What we want to make sure we do is we're treating that spasticity adequately so they don't become something called contractures. Contractures is where those muscles kind of become fixed in those positions, and they're really hard to move out of those positions. Um, cannabinoids is also another um, question that we get asked quite a bit about in terms of spasticity, so I've got a whole slide dedicated to that next. So when we talk about cannabinoids, we talk about this relationship between THC versus CBD. Um, and I preface this with all of us being saying the AAN, which is the American Academy of Neurology, in 2014 had some guidelines um, established about cannabinoids, which I've illustrated there on the side, but essentially said, hey, patients say they feel better, but we don't necessarily see that reflected in clinical exams that are done in the neurologist's office. Um, that third bullet point I have there has been a little bit of an update since the slides were made. 
Um, so we were originally about to start a Nebexmol phase three study, which is an oral spray. That's a combination of THC and CBD um, here, hopefully in the next month. But as of Thursday, the study has been paused because um, in other um, studies that they were doing, they didn't see an effect. So right now that's paused. And so we'll just leave that there. Let's talk a little bit about heat sensitivity. So this is another really common symptom that all of us here in the MS clinic. One of the things that I wanna illustrate is that it's not specific for MS. And what does heat sensitivity mean or what does it do? Um, to kind of explain that, let's talk a little bit about MS, which I recognize is probably basic for this group, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. When we think about what happens in MS, the issue is with nerve signal transmission down the cells. Um, and so you can imagine if I said, hey, I'm taking someone without MS and I'm putting them in the setting of high heat, like 100 degree weather, everyone's nerve signals are going to slow down to some degree. So now if I'm saying I'm adding in something that's going to slow down nerve signals and I'm already saying you have a lesion that's already interrupting nerve signals those two together become really additive. So patients say, gosh, when I'm in the heat, my leg feels like it's tingling, but that hasn't happened since my original diagnosis of MS. And this isn't isolated to just heat. It can happen with exercise. It can happen in the context of warm baths. It can happen in hot tubs, warm showers. Um, so it's important to recognize because it does not indicate that there is new inflammation going on, it does not indicate a new relapse, but rather it's a reminder of damage that has been done in those nerves in the past. So how do we treat this? So the important thing to think about is in what context does this happen? And can I realistically avoid those contexts? So we already talked about how exercise is really important for fatigue. We'll talk about how exercise is important for other things in just a few minutes. So gosh, if this is happening every time you exercise, how do we make it so you can continue to exercise but not feel terrible with the recurrence of these symptoms? So examples that I give is in the setting of if this is happening in the work environment. Um, I have had patients that say, gosh, I work at a car dealership. I need to walk outside um, in order to show cars, but it's really challenging to do in the summer. In those settings, we might say, gosh, let's create some work limitations or work restrictions like FMLA, where we can avoid you doing that on days where the temperature is above a certain degree. Cooling vests are um, these essentially fisherman type vests that have little pockets for ice packs, and they're available for all MS patients through the MSAA for free, I believe. Um, I think they can be really helpful. I think um, my personal bias with the cooling vests is that they can get really bulky, especially once those ice packs have melted. Um, my personal preference is to look into cooling clothing, cooling towels. Um, so, and I have no affiliation with this company by any means, but on Amazon, there is a type of microfiber cooling cloth where you just get it wet make it dry and then it's cool for about three hours and it's really lightweight. Um, some of my patients might say, gosh, I wrap that around my neck. I wrap that around my torso and it keeps me cool for three hours and it's really lightweight and you can get rid of it once it's warmed up. I think that makes a lot more sense than adding on something that's a little bit heavier. Staying well hydrated with cool water is important. Fans, um, if you have those misting fans, creating more, um, Condensation on the body's surface will also help with people cooling off faster. Um, avoidance of heat, certainly, if possible, is a good plan. They actually, um, for most of you, if you live in Colorado, um, Excel Energy has a program where MS patients can actually get a discount on monthly bills um, because you're theoretically using AC at higher levels than patients without MS. So that's something to talk about with your neurologist as well. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about mental health. Um, so depression and anxiety are really common in MS patients. We see it in up to 50% of patients. And this does also correlate to increased rate of suicidal thoughts. Now, one of the things that we don't quite understand very well about mental health or increased depression or anxiety in MS is how much of it is reactive, meaning how much of it is due to the diagnosis of MS, how much of it is 
a grief reaction in regards to what you can no longer do because of your MS versus how much of it is biologic, meaning there are lesions that are affecting the brain. So it would be very realistic to think that this is also changing brain chemistry and how one's reacting to situations. So what is important for us to think about with this? It's important to think about regular screenings for anxiety and depression, to know that depression doesn't always show up as, gosh, I'm crying all the time and I feel sad. Sometimes depression shows up as, I really enjoyed knitting before, but I no longer really care about that. Or I really enjoyed being social before, but I no longer care about going out and seeing friends anymore. Therapy, um, I don't think I can overemphasize how helpful therapy can be in both of these situations with anxiety and depression. Um, finding a good therapist I often relate to is kind of like dating. You got to find someone who's the right fit for you. Um, but just because you haven't found it on first go doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to try. I think this can be immensely helpful for all of our patients. We have a wonderful therapist through the MS Center. Her name's Alyssa Berlinger. Um, and if you go on the MS Center's website, you can find her information. But it's important to not only be able to discuss your MS, but also, I mean, again, having MS doesn't mean everything else that happens in life doesn't happen. So sometimes we need a little help. There are also a variety of medications that can be used from a mental health perspective. Um, again, I won't go through them in much detail, but just know there are a variety that can be available. You can discuss this with your neurologist. If you're someone that says, gosh, I've had all of these things um, and we've tried a ton of medicines and that hasn't been helpful, seeing psychiatry can be really helpful. We have a um, neurologist here that's also double boarded in psychiatry. That's a great aspect for some of our MS patients. So it might be something worthwhile if you're local discussing with your neurologist as well. Um, community engagement, which all of you in this room and all of you online are already doing just by being present here. Um, but again, can't overemphasize the value of community engagement, particularly in this setting. Let's talk a little bit about walking. So the majority of patients with MS report some sort of difficulty with walking or getting around. And now this is not necessarily a one size fits all for our MS patients. Some people have difficulty walking because of weakness. Some is ataxia, which is that off balance sensation. Some is because, gosh, when I put my feet down, unless I'm looking at them, I don't know where my feet are going. Some difficulties with walking are related to nerve pain. So pins and needles or burning. I've had some patients say, gosh, every time I walk, it feels like I'm walking on hot coals. Um, other individuals might say walking is really challenging because I can walk 5, 10, 50 feet, and then my legs just feel like I'm walking through quicksand. Um, let's talk about what we can do. So in terms of walking, things that are important, just like we emphasize with the fatigue, is to think about, well, gosh, is there anything else that could be contributing to difficulty walking? So things like, do I have arthritis in my knee or hips? that's making it more challenging for me to walk? Or do I have an old injury in my lower back that's contributing to difficulty walking that's being additive with my MS symptoms? Um, ambulatory devices and braces can be incredibly helpful. So the most common one that we tend to utilize is something called an ankle foot orthotic or an AFO, where if I say, gosh, the issue with MS is my foot is falling down like this, falling down like this, an ankle foot orthotic helps prop that leg or that foot up so I'm not catching my toes when walking. And I think this becomes really important because we try to balance, hey, I want you to use your muscles, but also I don't want you to trip and fall. And if you can use less energy, kind of talking about that preservation of energy and fatigue that we illustrated in our first slide, if you can preserve the energy you're trying to use thinking about how to walk properly and use it for something else that's more enjoyable, then let's do that. And I think that's one of the areas where braces can also be incredibly helpful. Um, there's also functional electrical stimulation systems. The most common one um, that people have utilized is something called the Bionest Symptom or Systems or Walk Right. Now, the issue with these is while they can be really effective, they're primarily targeting bringing that ankle up. So if you say, gosh, I've got ankle weakness, but I also have hip weakness, 
know that it does not necessarily hit all of it and might help with the ankles, but we're still left with hip weakness that might cause issues still with walking. These systems, um, which I've recently learned are covered by TRICARE, but are really poorly covered by most um, commercial insurances, um, is one of the biggest limitations of this system, which is just the fact that we can't get great insurance coverage for them. Physical therapy, again, I won't emphasize this too much because I know Michelle is going to have her talk next, um, but also critically important with walking issues. And then home modification. So thinking about things that put us at higher risk of things going wrong when we have walking issues. So like, for example, rugs that don't have the corners taped down are easy places for anyone to trip. But if we say we already have ankle weakness or balance issues, making sure that the corners of rugs are taped down is an important piece. Now, I think um, one of the things that we should emphasize is because if there is weakness or difficulty walking, does not mean you shouldn't do it. In fact, there is a concept called deconditioning, which is if you don't use it, you lose it in MS. So making sure you're continuing to work on these things, even though they are so incredibly difficult, is going to be really important. Um, one of the bugs I might put in is for Michelle Harrison's um, hydrotherapy program. Because again, if we think about all of these things that are way harder to do with gravity, they all become easier to some degree in a pool and you can't really fall over in a pool if the balance is an issue, but you can really strengthen those muscles that we really need to preserve in MS. I did wanna just spend a second talking about Ampira or Delfampridine. Um, so one of the things that this is commonly called is the walking pill in MS, which is a snazzy title that it's gotten I want to emphasize this is not a disease modifying therapy. So this should not be used in lieu of some of our other medicines. Well, how this medicine works is it works on the potassium channels in our nerve cells, which you don't need to remember, but it helps keep the signals within the nerve. So really should enhance um, nerve message transmission. So although it has been FDA approved for walking, there's no reason to think that this could not also be helpful for other symptoms other than motor fatigue associated with walking. Um, so can it be helpful for spasticity? Can it be helpful for hand dexterity, things like that? I think the answer to that is very potentially could be, although that's not what's under the FDA approved indication. Um, one of the things with this is talking about limitations with this medicine is if you've got kidney issues, if you have a history of seizures, those would probably be situations where we don't want to use this medication. Um, and we should also talk about, and I think I recently met someone in the bathroom who is a Delphamphrodine or the Impura representative. Um, the thing with this is we can often get a 60-day trial from the company for free. And so I usually say, gosh, if you don't have any of those two conditions that I already touched on, like the seizures or the kidney issues, it might be worth a try to see if symptoms feel better. Let's talk about cognition for a second. So what, does, what do cognitive symptoms in MS look like? They can really look like anything. Most common things that we probably hear is difficulty with information processing, short-term memory loss, um, difficulty with attention, concentration, multitasking, or word recall where, gosh, I've got this word on the tip of my tongue, but I can't figure out what word it is. So how do we evaluate this and how do we treat for it? Again, thinking about other causes is going to be important. Other causes include thyroid issues. Other causes include vitamin deficiencies. Other causes include not getting enough quality and quantity of sleep if I haven't harped on that already enough. Remaining physically and cognitively active is our, the biggest tool that we've got in our toolbox in terms of preventing this from getting worse. And then, of course, being compliant with your disease-modifying therapy. We know that we can often see in a proportion of patients that have more active disease being related to cognitive decline. Cognitive rehab available through speech language pathology can be incredibly helpful as well. And then thinking about safety at home. Um, 
things that help with cognition and MS is having a very standardized regimen of I do the same things as a routine or something that becomes habit or becomes a habit as opposed to trying to do something in a novel way every day. One of the most common questions we get asked is, is my memory issue related to my MS or is this normal aging? And I don't know that we've got a great answer to this. We do talk about neuropsych testing being helpful. And there's a couple of ways neuropsych testing can be helpful. It is really helpful to get a baseline of what someone's cognition looks like. So in the future, should cognitive issues continue to worsen, we know what to compare it to. Um, it can also be helpful at saying, hey, these are areas where I have deficits and let me focus in on those areas. And then we'll end on this, which is symptomatic management of bladder symptoms. Most common symptoms that we hear about is urinary frequency, urgency, hesitancy, which is I really felt like I had to urinate, but I sat on the toilet and then realized nothing was coming out and or retention. So important things on here is to watch for urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections in MS patients don't look the same necessarily as they might look in someone without MS. So sometimes they won't show up as I feel burning or I feel like I always have to go because the always have to go might be part of someone's baseline. So looking out for cloudy or foul smelling urine is really important there. There are a variety of medications we can use based on what someone's bladder symptoms sound like. And urology can also assist us with doing Botox injections for a hyperactive bladder. But the urologists are an important piece of the care team here when someone's got bladder issues related to MS. Great, thank you.